Hello, everyone. We're going to start in just one minute. I do want to remind everyone that we are going to be recording. We are recording. And um, <clears throat> I'm very excited that this topic is on the agenda. This is something that I am very interested in myself. Um, first started looking at and working with embedded librarianship back in 2010. So I'm excited to see how everything has evolved over some time. Uh, I'd like to introduce our two presenters, Jewel De La Rosa and Jackie Coffee Scott, both from SUNY Erie Community College. Jewel is the outgoing chair at the North Campus. She's the lead on the Embedded Librarian Program and the Virtual Information Literacy Task Force, coordinating new online initiatives and creating video tutorials and online library instruction and creating partnerships with faculty and students within their online class environment. And Jackie is the college librarian also at the North Campus, serves as an embedded librarian and instructor of library resources. Jackie earned her MLS from the University of Buffalo and in May 2020 achieved the SUNY Teaching and Learning Certificate. So uh, welcome to our presenters and thank you very much and we will get started. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Holly. Um, so yes, I am Jewel De La Rosa. I'm going to be beginning this presentation. We're going to break it down into um, three parts. Um, I'll begin by giving some background information on how we define an embedded librarian program. I know it is different at every institution, what embedded means to us, and give a little bit of history of how this program came about, um, some statistics on it, as well as leading up into today um, with, with the pandemic and how that it's all changed and, and the impetus for creating the repository in order to make it more manageable. Um, okay, so the Embedded Librarian Program at SUNY Erie um, it was created to assign librarians to research-based courses within Blackboard. So working within Blackboard, librarians collaborate with faculty to provide assistance to students. Um, typically, this requires a great deal of planning prior to a semester. Um, we have a ticketing system now in place where a faculty member requests an embedded librarian through an IT ticket. Um, that request is sent to an embedded coordinator. So SUNY Erie, if you're not familiar, has three distinct campuses. So we have a coordinator at each campus who actually um, coordinates this and assigns the librarians to each course once it's requested by faculty. All of this is managed by distance learning. I, I know that's also something that's very different at each, at each school. Faculty at, at SUNY Erie do not have the ability to add or, or um, delete any members from their courses. So this all has to be managed by distance learning. Um, so typically the librarian will post a welcome message early in the semester, often um, recording a video of themselves to introduce themselves, create the terms for the semester of what their presence will be in the course. It can be anywhere from just a few weeks in a semester surrounding a research assignment, but most typically it is throughout the entire semester that the librarian has the presence in the course. Um, so they really get to know the students, the faculty members, the ex expectations and assignments. Um, we interact with students in discussion forums. We help them broaden topics, research papers, annotated bibliographies, recommend resources, plug in um, all sorts of tutorials and resources as well. And um, we really find that these frequent interactions with librarians and students really help the students better understand what the library has to offer, navigate our resources, and they result in um, better utilized scholarly resources for their papers. Um, we hear from faculty really often that this keeps them from just defaulting to Google, right? <laughs> Having that personal interaction with a librarian um, directly in Blackboard um, really helps facilitate that. Okay, next slide. So this program was piloted first, um, what feels like a lifetime ago, in spring and summer 2014. Um, I was the pilot librarian for this uh, when I started full time at SUNY Erie. Started this program um, back in those dark ages. We still had uh, telecourses where students would come in and, and take recorded um, online classes. And I really question how our, our online students um, getting the information literacy instruction that was always provided in person for seated classes. We were missing, I felt, an entire population of students, which is even more true today, particularly in this past year, right? So the discussion started in spring and summer 
2014, it was not an easy task to get this, this program going. There was a lot of hesitancy on faculty's part um, in terms of bringing another um, faculty member into their course. You know, there were concerns about um, privacy. There are concerns about librarians accessing student grades or changing content. There was also hesitancy on the behalf of the distance learning department um, because they had such a strong hold on um, who was added to courses and they really maintained that. And so they had a, some, they were hesitant to, to give us um, a, a spot <laughs> at the table. Um, so after the initial pilot, the initial pilot was just myself and one English faculty member in fall of 2014. We then put this forward in, term, in front of the College Senate to get it approved as a, as a role in Blackboard as an embedded librarian in the fall of 2015. Um, and we were given the following rights. You can go to the next screen, Jackie. Um, so it was very specific in that what we could add, what we could delete, what we had access to for FERPA regulations and such. Um, during the pilot, distance learning had it so tight that if I added uh, an, an article or a video to a class, I couldn't delete it. I couldn't edit it. I had to contact distance learning for them to go in and make changes. And that was quickly found to be, um, you know, really impossible. So we had to have specific rights. And this was approved um, from the College Senate in fall of 2015. And that's really when the program started getting going. Um, okay, we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> So growth and use over the years. Um, the program, like I said, started in 2014, 2015. By fall of 2016, it was officially offered at all three campuses with just 12 courses that were covered by six librarians. In order for a librarian to be an embedded librarian, they had to complete the Blackboard Basics course that was offered by distance learning, the same as for faculty. Um, so initially there were six librarians that offered and volunteered to go through that training, online training to be Blackboard certified in order to be embedded. The program grew slowly each semester in both the number of courses and the number of librarians participating in the program. Um, statistics show in the last full semester prior to the pandemic. So we went remote in, gosh, what, what year even was that? March of, of 2020, 2019, whatever that was. <laughs> Feels like 10 years ago in my life. Um, but prior to that, we had 26 courses managed by seven librarians. Oh, I have it in my hair. Okay. Campuses transi transitioned to fully remote in the spring of 2020 and saw this increase to 52 courses. So from one semester to the next, our embedded doubled. Um, fall of 2020 was entirely remote at SUNY Erie, and this increased to 84 courses with 16 librarians. So what started as a, as a really... Um, you know, a really beloved program. It was really appreciated by the faculty that participated in it, but it was smaller, right? Um, it was well used by English faculty. All of a sudden when we weren't remote, the use of it just skyrocketed. Um, and we really started wondering how is this sustainable? Because as everyone knows, our, our staffing did not increase at all in this. Um, so the demands for this were, were much stronger. Okay, Jackie, next slide. Um, so initially the program was targeting English, right? They were the easiest buy-in for us to, to embed in. Um, we had already had a great relationship with the English faculty in terms of doing um, in-person instruction. So it was really easy to transition into embedded. But over the course of the last few years, it's grown to include several um, occupational therapy classes, dietetic technology, medical assisting, theater, drama, um, and many more departments. So beginning with one librarian in 2014, it's now included majority of both full and part-time librarians being Blackboard certified and participating um, during the pandemic. Um, out of all three campuses, I think we may still have one or two that do not participate, but the majority do participate in the embedded librarian program now. We have seen that our one-shot library instruction sessions have de decreased as the embedded library program has increased over the last year. I think that's partially because of the pandemic largely, but I do think that when we return back in person in the fall, this trend will continue. Um, just because um, as we all know, when we do a one-shot instruction, you don't get to see the outcomes of that. You don't get to get to know the students and work with them throughout the semester, which is the huge benefit of being an embedded librarian. So we have, as far as I know, once we're embedded in an instructor's course, they ask for us semester after semester, semester. We have not really lost any faculty we've only gained, um, which I think is really a testimony to the success of the program. 
And this really has allowed librarians and our services to remain relevant and vital during this transition to remote instruction. Um, we've It's played a huge role in information literacy across the college. Um, we have been vital in our general education committee and reporting and information literacy instruction because of this we've really been able to um, remain relevant through this time even though the library physically has not been open since um, the pandemic started we've been doing all of our services virtual so this has been a really great way that we've had this established program to continue that okay next slide so as you can imagine, as exciting as the growth has been to double from one semester to the next and then almost double in the next semester again, it's also presented some great challenges of how do we sustain this? How do we become more efficient um, in serving these courses while our staffing has remained stagnant, if not decreased? We've had um, a few retirements and um, positions leave and we have a hiring freeze now. So there is no filling of these positions. So how do we, really maintain all of the duties we normally maintain and increase this program across multiple departments, campuses with that same level of staffing and really offer the same level of service. This growth has required many librarians to be embedded in, in many 10 courses in a semester. Um, and with courses and librarians across three distinct campuses, we obviously often have issues with communication and consistency. And we've noticed a lot of duplication of efforts. Um, it's hard to really communicate what you're utilizing in courses and share that with librarians who are at a campus 45 minutes away that you don't interact with, right? Um, and so we wanted to consolidate these efforts and become more efficient in what we were offering. And also in order to sustain the growth and provide, we have some less experienced librarians, part-time librarians who may not have been here long and have not participated as embedded librarians. So we wanted to really have a centralized location where we had our resources to help those librarians succeed. Next one. So the idea for this content repository was born. Um, we had a meeting of our instruction librarians at each of the three campuses, as well as myself, who is the embedded lead, to determine a basic outline of what the content repository would accomplish and what it would look like. Um, it was decided that the best place for this would be right within Blackboard. We have a course shell that was created by distance learning um, in Blackboard. And we um, decided that the librarians who were embedded in the most courses had the most experience in the specific disciplines would be responsible for filling in the content for the classes and the content areas that they're most familiar with. Um, this makes it really easy when you're added to a course within Blackboard to just move the content from the repository right into your course because it's all within the same system. Um, prior to this, we had information in all different locations, right? We had campuses that had their own Google Drive. We had things that were located within where they were created. We had videos on YouTube. Um, but by putting the information all in the repository, it makes it so much easier to access the content. And if you're added to a course that you've never been embedded before, you have the, the template of, of items to work with from day one. Um, so at, after this meeting, a single person was assigned to set up the frame and a deadline was set for content to be added. And that single person that we decided, lucky duck, was Jackie. So um, Jackie's been heavily involved in our instruction and embedded since she began at SUNY Erie and has been just a huge asset in getting this repository going. So um, I'm going to turn this part of the um, presentation over to Jackie and she will be able to discuss what the repository looks like and give more information on that. Thank you, Jewel. Um, so like Jewel talked about, the, um, it was, the repository was created as a shell in Blackboard. Um, so it was just like an empty class that we could populate with whatever we wanted um, and all of the librarians who have had the Blackboard training, they have access to the items in the repository. Um, but, and you're, you'll see this when we do the tour, the content that's actually in there, um, it's, it's created and maintained by specific librarians who have um, the most experience or a lot of experience um, being embedded in specific classes. Some classes we all teach regularly. And in that case, it was sort of, you know, just decided, okay, this is the person who's taught it a lot and they, they've got a lot of good content. Other classes had only be, been taught um, 
historically by one librarian. So they were the ones who were um, assigned to insert the content into the Blackboard for those classes. Um, so I did create the overall structure. You're gonna see it's, there's no real magic here. Um, it's organized by subject first and then broken down into specific classes. Um, and I, another way that we decided what, how to create that structure is, is we looked at our statistics to see, okay, what classes we were um, most frequently embedded in. And then based on that, we assigned to the librarians that had taught those classes the most. So this was based on, on statistics. We didn't just open the um, Erie uh, class catalog and say, all right, let's create um, something for classes that we had never been embedded uh, before. So um, I'm going to exit out of here and I'm going to take you on a tour of our library repository. So this is our um, Blackboard environment. I'm gonna go into our library deposit repository. So again, all of our librarians have access to this right here. This is where I'm talking about where everything is um, broken down by subject first. So these are the subject areas where historically embedded librarians had been requested in the past. By far and away, our largest one is English. Um, I'm just gonna show you, we, we do have quite a few English classes. I'll go into English um, 100 towards the end because there is a novel um, tool in there that I think is interesting, um, that will be interesting to people to see. Um, but just because I'm the most familiar with it, I do teach the majority of the embedded classes um, in the Occupational Therapy Assistant Program. So I'm going to actually go into that subject area. So I'm gonna go into the Occupational Therapy and I'm just gonna use my OT 101. So um, one thing I wanted to just discuss really briefly, um, it's kind of different. There's a lot of different scenarios about with regard to how embedded librarians are used in classes. Um, some classes, teacher or instructors want synchronous instruction. Um, I've noticed with the health sciences classes, they still want synchronous instruction with the, a librarian, um, whether that be, uh, you know, what would be the one shot type of class. And I'm telling you this because you're gonna see that reflected in, in the type of content that I've shared in the repository. Um, other classes, um, there are more, opportunities to create asynchronous um, content. And uh, you'll see that in, the, in that English class in particular. And, and then sometimes um, instructors really don't want anything more than just having library content um, you know, that students can access from the library resources tab uh, within the Blackboard. Um, so they don't expect the students, they don't expect the librarian to come in and do any instruction and they don't make it a requirement for the students to reach out to us, but the, our content with our links are in there. So there's just a few different ways that this content gets utilized. And so it sort of differs across the different subject areas, how things are um, created what's and what's shared. Um, so mine is very much, you'll see, I'm gonna go into OT 101. I do do a lot of, even before the pandemic, and then now, especially um, during the pandemic, I've done a lot of synchronous instruction um, classes. So these are the types of things that get shared. I would imagine that the, the greeting, the uh, greeting is different and, and each embedded librarian would wanna create their own. I have updated mine periodically, but you know, if someone wanted to go in and utilize, you know, get ideas based on what I did in my introduction, that's not a problem. So I, I keep it in the repository just in case somebody needs ideas. Um, this one is actually a little bit embarrassing um, because I think I did it on the fly one day just to sort of catch up with, with what was happening at the time. Uh, probably needs to be redone, but I, I think it's pretty typical that each one of us has something like that in our various classes. Um, scrolling down, everybody has some form of a greeting. Mine right now is quite lengthy. 
in comparison in the past, it, it was it was a little bit shorter, but I felt like I needed to have more information in here um, during the pandemic. I'm, I, I haven't looked in other people's classes, but I would suspect that there's also included um, a more lengthy greeting to students just with more information about availability um, and how to get in touch with us. Um, a lot of the other instructors, when I was poking in their, their classes, in their, in their classes today, the librarians in their classes, I noticed that they were really nice and they created theirs as templates so that people, when they copied these into their classes, it would be very quickly, they would be able to just embed their own personal information. For example, instead of it says here, it says, I am Jackie Poppy Scott, they put in I am, and there's like a blank there, which I think is really nice. I think that I've kept mine this way because I, again, I'm mostly the person who does the OTA embedded classes. So I just kind of copy and paste from here every semester. Um, but definitely if anybody ever wanted this, they could copy and paste this with all of this information in it and then just go in and change it. There's, there's no reason, although I don't know that they would want to keep my picture there. They probably want to put their own picture. Um, but um, again, it's it's an easy thing to um, just just edit um, once you've copied it into a another uh, classroom. Um, another nice thing, and there's a lot of different types of links, um, and it's all based on what the requirements of your class are. So because I again needed to teach uh, synchronous instruction classes. And then in some cases, students were required to make appointments with me. Nice thing about Blackboard is that you can, uh, I could get my schedule link here. I'll just like click on it. Um, to, that linked directly to LibCal. And that's nice too, because I can just copy and paste that every semester. Now, would another librarian be able to copy and paste this exact thing? No, but it might be a trigger for them if they saw this in, in my Blackboard in the repository to say, oh, I can do this. Maybe you know I'll send Jackie an email and ask her how to do it or send our system librarian a question on how to do that. So, and there is there are actually instructions in our repository how to do, how to um, create this link. So again, maybe sometimes it can just be a trigger of, you know, this is an idea that I want to use going forward. So, um, so that's in there as well. Most of us have some form of a, a link to our library website. Um, I'm not gonna click on it, um, but it's it just a nice placeholder for students. Um, sometimes this is the only place, the only online place that they're coming to with regard to their class. Um, if their instructor in, in tells them to go to the library resources tab, that might be a trigger to remember, oh, right, I'm supposed to use the library resources when I'm doing my research paper. Um, other times, if they've had instruction with me, this is one of the big things that we go over. So again, you know, this is a, this is a heavily, I think I pulled this from somebody else's um, in the past, um, somebody else's, even from before the repository, someone shared this with me. So um, this is a very common link that I've seen across different classes. Another popular thing um, is that we would share our live guides. So there's a lot of different types of content in media that, um, that we share. So, so far I've just talked about different links um, and, and basically text. Um, there are important links and tools that we have within the library. Um, one of them being our live guides or research guides. So this one um, is very specific to the OTA program. There are some live guides that people use that are very specific to classes. Um, this one, I'm just going to click on it very quickly. This one is, is it, um, links to the, to the live guide for the OTA program and goes over the different library resources. Again, I think these are just good triggers for students to remember, oh, right, that's, that's what she was talking about during class, or this is what my professor wants me to do, um, use when I'm, when I'm doing my research paper. And so I, I, again, this one is a subject specific one. So it's a lot more broad and base, basic versus um, some of the more class specific ones. Um, and there are many of those for the English classes. 
um, where it really gets into some very specific stuff. But going back to the repository, so um, so that's links to live guides. Um, we also have links to video tutorials. So I'll click here. And again, these are things that can be copied and you know into the Blackboard from one um, library into another. Also, again, triggers. I mean, not everybody is going to want to link to my occupational therapy um, live guide, but it might be a trigger to think, oh, I can, you know, whatever class I'm teaching, I can link to a couple of live guides and um, utilize them as part of my Blackboard presence. Um, so this is another common thing that we use our videos. So I link to multiple things. I link to the SUNY Erie YouTube channel. I also link to specific videos that I think apply to classes. Again, these can just be copied and pasted into other people's, um, you know, other librarians' uh, library resources tab in different classes. So it's just, uh, it's this is just the easiest way um, to share that. Most um, most of the librarians use the um, Suniri Libraries videos in their classes. Um, sometimes they do create their own videos for class specific things, um, such as the greeting. That would be an example. Um, sometimes it's a tutorial for something that comes up during the course of the class. Um, that that I will show you an example of that in one of my classes. And that also can be a nice thing to share um, if you do kind of poke around in, in you know, if the librarians at SUNY Erie poke around and look in what other people have, have posted um, so that you're not duplicating things over and over again. Um, but these are, these do actually exist as part of our, um, part of our video repository that exists on our YouTube channel. And all of these are from the YouTube channel as well. Again, just trying to give the students as many opportunities to remember either what was discussed during an instruction session with a librarian or if their professor or instructor mentioned it. Um, so going back, citation help. This is a very common, um, thing that gets copied and pasted. Um, the OTA program, they use APA, but we also have MLA um, in other classes that can be shared. Um, it's just a good way of, of sharing information with the students. Um, I will show you one example here. So I do have some links in here. One is to the OWL at Purdue APA guide, but then I there's also a link here to our SUNY Erie APA tutorial. This is a LibWizard guide. Um, so again, these are just easy links to share, to, to copy and paste um, as the embedded librarian. Um, but it's also a trigger, again, to remember, oh, these things are available to students so that you don't feel like you have to keep remaking the wheel all the time. Um, so this is a, a very nice LibWizard um, tutorial that was created by Carrie Thomas Whiteside. Um, and it is available on the library's page but students don't always know how to get to it. So um, it's a nice thing to include in our, um, in our Blackboard presence. Um, the final thing for the OTA program is um, library class content. And this is something that's probably mostly specific to um, someone who teaches in, in a synchronous um, situation. So I include in here my slides and a lot of my slides have links in them, um, again, so that students can be reminded if they miss the class or if they forget about something and they, they need to go back and see. Um, but these are also available for librarians if they you know, end up needing being embedded in one of these classes and needing the information, or even if they're just looking for, you know, help on, I'm making a presentation in a, in a health sciences related class, what does Jackie do? Or, you know, it's, it's just a really nice way to, to keep this information open and available to the other librarians in case they feel like they need it. 
And this is an example. This was sort of one of those on the fly. Um, the student needed help learning how to set up Google Scholar for to see what's in our SUNY Erie holdings. And it's just a nice place for me to keep this. Should I make one for the SUNY Erie um, uh, YouTube channel? Yes, I should. But this was just a quick and easy way for me to get this up there for the students during the semester. I'll probably try and make a clean, a nice version of this um, for the YouTube channel eventually. Um, I do often do post instruction activities. This is also where those live. Um, again, it's just it's it's a good trigger to remind people this is something that you could be doing if they want to use my post instruction activity. Here it is. Um, so again, these are just the things that that we use most frequently and and we try to keep and share with one another. Um, I do want to get out of the OTA world here for a moment. So that's an example of, you know, a synchronous situation, meaning asynchronous. I, I taught this synchronously. Um, <laughs> um, in an asynchronous situation, I wanted to share from this English class. This is another um, another LibWizard tutorial that was created by Carrie Thomas Whiteside, and I think it's it's a nice example. Is this the right one? And I, I um, love Jackie how Carrie is on this session and she's getting all of the kudos unexpectedly during this, <laughs> this session as well. <laughs> well, you know, it works. Um, so I think that this is a really, I'm not going to open it, um, but I, not only do I think that this is a great example of asynchronous um, instruction, but I also think that this is a great example of collaboration. I, um, I know that these take can take a really, really long time. And Carrie actually created this as a template and put it in here as a template so that any of us at SUNY Erie who want to take this and kind of make it our own if we need to do this, um, this will save us a lot of time and frustration um, later down the line. So sharing these types of things um, with other librarians, especially off, across all three campuses, I mean, some of us, especially the part-time librarians, we, we've never even met each other in person. So um, this is just a really nice way to um, to have this all of this stuff available to one another um, to help each other. And then we're not all recreating things from scratch every time something comes up, which a lot came up over the past year. So um, this is just a really nice, you know, because not every instructor wants to take up a, a class um, to have a librarian come in and do an in-person session, so um, or a virtual in-person session. So this is this this tool was created. It sort of dovetails with an assignment um, that that um, Carrie collaborated with the professor on. So um, students had to complete this as part of their assignment. So um, it's really great example of asynchronous instruction, but also um, obviously it's, it's there for us to kind of pick, pick at and figure out if we can use it in some way, shape or form. So that's it with regard to the, um, to the repository, the tour of the repository. Um, I'm gonna pop out of here and I'm gonna go to slide 11 if I can get this to respond. Found. Nope, I'm going to go to slide 12. Okay. So, oops, I'm starting from the beginning. Okay, we'll just skip. Okay, so our future outlook for the program. So, obviously, I, I mean, Jewel said this, and this has certainly been my experience. Usually, when you've been embedded in somebody's classroom, they kind of want you forever, um, mm -hmm. which is nice. It's 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 a really nice feeling. Um, and you know, with with this being so popular, I I do hope I I, ex I hope I don't want to say I expect, but I hope that it continues once we're all in person again. Um, so 
I think that um, having these tools, especially when we're all sort of jostling to get back into the reality of being in person, having these tools available um, that we're sharing is really going to help um, with that that collaboration. And even if things continue to grow, um, so the the plan is is that librarians who have been assigned to that whatever their um, class is, they're expected to maintain and update their content on an as needed basis. And that's gonna vary um, from one librarian to another. I know that there's things that I have to go in and update because I probably haven't updated them since, um, since the fall possibly, um, but um, probably on a yearly basis, um, just, just keep that um, up to date. And then the with regard to the future, um, one thing that we talked about is um, using this and also, you know, some other tools to do more formal assessment of our embedded librarian program, because it is not part, it's not necessarily part of our instruction assessment. Um, so that was something that we hoped to look at for the future with regard to our embedded librarian program. And with that, yes, I hand it over to Jewel. Yes, and I just want to add one thing that you know, time will tell how um, this program continues to grow. We're coming, we're expecting to return in person in the fall. Um, my expectation will be that the embedded librarian program will will continue to be in demand and and continue to grow, even though we will be offering more in-person instruction as well. Um, I've already started receiving requests for embedded librarians for the fall semester, um, which is not normally the case this early in June, um, and for courses that we've never been embedded in. So that that's really promising. So I'm really grateful that we have this repository and it really, like Jackie said, offers a great way to collaborate amongst librarians. And um, we all know often when we're teaching, we're teaching in a silo. And, and unless we get to observe each other for observations and, and evaluations, we don't always get to learn from each other in this, in this way. Um, and the librarians have been really generous to share resources that they've created um, for us all to work for the, you know, the common goal of serving the students, which has been really great during this time. Um, so what we want to do now is transition into more informal discussion. I'm really interested um, I've been kind of living and breathing embedded since I became a, a real librarian, um, but I don't get to talk to other to other librarians about really how how they utilize it. Do you have it at your campus? What does that look like? What does embedded mean to you? Um, and if you don't, is it something that you were thinking about pursuing, um, or have you tried it and it, and and maybe it didn't really stick like it did at SUNY Erie? So we created a Padlet um, so you can utilize this QR code or I'll see if I can plug the URL um, into the chat, or maybe you can, you know, just grab it. And we want, we have a series of questions. So I'm gonna share my screen so that, um, or maybe Jackie, could you plug it into the chat? Yeah. Okay, because I'm gonna share my screen and open up the Padlet and see if we can get everyone participating and adding some, um, some feedback here. Okay, so we have um, four columns. So the first one is, do you have an embedded program? And if so, is the program for in-person classes or online only? Um, in creating our embedded program, we really found that this means, you know, it means different things for different places. Some people consider an embedded librarian um, to be a course librarian who teaches classes in person. For SUNY Erie, it was really created um, for in the online environment. Um, so our embedded librarians are working within only in Blackboard primarily. Um, the second column, how are ideas and resources shared among librarians? Do you have a repository or something similar to this? I know that we are a, a bit unique in that we have the three campuses, um, but, but how is this, how are ideas and resources shared amongst your librarians? The third, what types of resources do you utilize? So as Jackie showed you, we have videos, libguides, um, libwizard, um, various tutorials um, that we create. I'm really interested in seeing what types of resources you create. Um, we're hoping to share some ideas here and, and learn from each other. And also the last but not least, any other questions, ideas, or comments? Okay. 
and we have this as anonymous so i don't know who is who is typing it in but maybe we could have some conversation going here based on these responses So it's interesting that you have a repository for all instruction, not just embedded. I um, that's that would be great. I think that prior to the pandemic and prior to this repository, I found that librarians were kind of hesitant to share what they've created, right? Hesitant to share their um, course materials. I wonder if that will change once we return. Maybe we can broaden this. Um, to go beyond embedded. Well, this is Holly. I can comment on that because I put in that comment for Plattsburgh. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the way it's utilized here really is as a template. So the repository is the starting point because people have their, their own sort of perspectives, their own authentic teaching styles. And so they definitely do not simply uh, copy and paste or lift and drop. But having a starting point can really shortcut the, the effort. And that's what we were, that's why we were using it. Mm -hmm. Joel, there were some questions in the chat, and I don't know if you want to address them. Um, well, first of all, and I can show this, um, I don't want to show it during the Padlet, but um, it, they, someone asked, um, how does it look in the class in which you are embedded? Um, I can actually show it, but it really would just be a student preview, and it honestly looks very similar to what I was showing you in the repository, at least as far as how SUNY Erie has it set up. I would, all I would be doing is clicking on a button that says student preview, and it would take away some of the editing, like what, what looks like it can be edited, but the, the way that it's formatted and everything like that, it looks basically the exact same way. So that's the answer. I think um, Maggie asked that question. Um, the next question, and Jewel, you may want to answer this was, um, Is it, are the embedded librarians exclusively in courses where faculty members have requested it? Is there a way to ensure all sections, regardless of instructor, receive the same level of embedded librarian support? No, it is all directed by faculty. It's a, a specific request that the faculty member has to put in um, to request an embedded librarian. Um, without an embedded librarian, there is a, a link, you know, to, to the library within Blackboard in every course, but to get the librarian involved in the specific course, it has to be um, facilitated by the instructor. Um, usually it first starts with a conversation between the librarian and the instructor before the instructor places that request, um, but not always. Um, it, it often is born as well after we've done instruction or, or developed the relationship with faculty, we kind of lure them in, but it's always directed by the faculty member. Um, so I see a few questions under the questions and comments field too that I'd like to address. So once the library contents in Blackboard, what is your involvement throughout the semester? How much time do you commit? So this really varies from instructor to instructor and course to course. There's no kind of set um, guideline for this. Um, some courses that aren't really um, heavily research-based, we will plug our content in it will be a ghost town until that research paper comes up. And then all of a sudden the students, you know, want to make appointments with us and, and discuss things with us, but we're not really on their radar throughout the semester. Other courses we are, you know, have a, a large presence throughout and we are um, participating in discussion forums. We have some librarians that, especially this past year, were attending all of the synchronous sessions of the course and participating in the course with, with the faculty member um, and really guiding the students through week to week. That 
is not the norm for sure, um, because that's not really sustainable for all of us in every environment, but it, it can be every, anything from the faculty member only wants us to really plug content in to the course and not have a lot of student interaction that might not really occur every semester with every class. Um, it's somewhere in, in the middle of all of that. Certainly when, um, when I'm bringing on a new librarian who's embedded, I, I tell them really be um, concrete in what you're putting in your introduction in terms of expectations of when you will check the discussion form, when you are available by email so that students know what your involvement is. It really is born out of a conversation though with the faculty member of what the presence should look like. You know, it depends on the assignments and the load. Um, but really we need to at least be checking our Blackboard courses um, a few times a week at the minimum, I'd say, to see if there's any um, interaction that's necessary, but it's anywhere from a few weeks during the semester or through the whole semester, it really depends. Um, and how did you get faculty buy-in? Faculty at my institution will ask to send them a video, but nothing else, no involvement in Blackboard. So this is really how it started. Um, all you need to do is find one willing faculty member, which is what I did, um, someone who found the concept interesting and thought it would be helpful, and then word spreads, right? If you have a few successful interactions, word spreads within a department, and um, that's how our program was really created. It is positive feedback and positive interactions with the students. There was a lot of hesitancy in the beginning. Faculty were not comfortable with having another um, librarian. We, we were faculty at Student Erie in their course, right? To see to see their instructor instruction and interact. Um, particularly if this was a concept they weren't at all familiar with before, they were really hesitant. But it, having a few positive interactions, it really helped get the ball rolling um, and the English department was the easiest target. It, it was immediate as soon as we began the program that really took off. So that would be my my suggestion to you. Um, and as we said, once we're in, we're in, which is kind of a double-edged sword because now, now that's when it becomes a little overwhelming. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of the plug and play too that I think you brought up Holly, it is very personalized. We put the things in the repository and librarians have the choice to use them or, or not to use them, right? And they may plug a few things in and then um, personalize it for themselves, but it gives a really amazing starting point, especially if you, you know, if you're a part-time librarian and you're starting the semester with six courses that you've never never been embedded before, you want to start, you know, it's really important to start the semester off with content in there and introduce yourself from the beginning to get on the student's radar. So this is a really great and easy way to do it. Okay. Do you see anything else on here, Jackie, that we should? I don't, but I do, I do have a, um, the ability to share um, what, because, um, Maggie said that she wanted to see how it shows up in the class. And I think what she means is where it shows up almost in the menu on the left. So if you want me, I can just share this really quickly just sure. so that she can see. <coughs> She's saying, yes, yeah, that's what she wants. Yeah, yeah. So I can stop sharing this then because we're done with this, right? I think so, unless there's more down below. I can't, I can't tell. Okay. Okay. So I will share this screen and I'm gonna I'm gonna click out of it very quickly because I don't want to share um, another person's uh, classroom. Um, but this is the basic classroom on the left hand side here and this is just how it looks in in our student Erie. the the instructors in this classroom, they set up the um, their class how they want. And then I add this library resources tab. So if I click here, here's my content. And I must not have given them a, a video. Maybe I knew it was old and I didn't want them to see it. So yeah, it's just all of the stuff that I that I just showed you. So that's how it looks. It, it lives in a tab off, off to the left. You know, it can be moved. Um, you know, this is the student preview. Um, so this is what it looks like to students. Um, so it just is a little bit of a cleaner version, um, but that's how they access all of the library's resources. So in my case, um, with my OTA classes, it's not spread out throughout the classroom. Other instructors have their content spread out throughout the classroom, um, depending on how they, what they're doing with their instructor. It's very highly dependent on the, um, the teachers and the instructors, how they want the content. Um, but this is just how the OTA department and I do this. 
глаза. Time really went by. I, it, we're right at, at two or three here. Um, but yeah, it is it is really dependent on the on the instructor. I always do the same thing. I do a library materials folder, but I know a lot of other librarians plug their resources directly in the lessons folders within Blackboard for each week. So it, it just depends on, on what the librarian's style is and what the instructor really wants and what the course you know demands. How, how much content you really need filtered in for each week. Um, that, that really depends. That's why the communication is key. And this has really created a great inroad for us to collaborate with faculty um, so that you know, we can show that we are faculty and we, we are a team. Um, and I think that's been one of the greatest benefits of this program is helping to facilitate those conversations. Does anyone else have any other questions or comments before time's up? <laughs> Um, there was a question, no formal assessment, but do you get faculty comments? We do. We do get um, faculty comments, faculty feedback. Um, and it has really all been very positive. Um, they, they see a direct correlation between having an embedded librarian and the results, particularly on, on research assignments. Um, that, that students are turning in, uh, which has been really great. We've gotten some really great rewarding reviews. Um, you know, we've gone up for rank advancement or, or tenure. Faculty that have had embedded have been really enthusiastic to, to comment on the success of it, um, which is really, really rewarding. And it shows, you know, when they request us from semester to semester. Do you typically end up seeing more? Yes, we do see more research appointments where there are embedded librarians, um, which, which is great. Sometimes the students do it directly through the course with the librarian, like Jackie showed the link. Other times they will go into our um, appointment booking on our, on our website. Some instructors also require appointments with librarians. Um, so that's often facilitated that way as well with an embedded librarian. It's usually, you know, the same faculty that encourage their students to use the library, which are the faculty that encourage, you know, that, that will have an embedded librarian. So the two really go hand in hand. Which makes it kind of tricky during certain weeks of the semester when everything's coming, coming to a head at the same time. I think in that case, we're going to end our session. Um, absolute sincere thank you to both of you, Jewel and Jackie. This is terrific information. It's terrific work. The collaboration, the sharing of resources, working towards efficiency, working towards really providing value to your campus, showcasing the library, what we can do for student learning. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all for attending. Yeah, thank you for coming. And, and reach out, feel free to reach out if you have any more questions, if you're looking to start a program like this at, at your campus and have it, you um, can certainly contact me by email um, and we can discuss it if you want any more help. Okay, thank you. Holly, just, somebody just asked how, um, if we were gonna have a link to the slides, if we can discuss that with you at the end. Sure. Yep. Actually, if you, uh, presenters, if you can email me your slides, this is Jocelyn Ireland. Okay. With the recording. Okay. We will make sure we do that. Thank you. Thanks, Jocelyn. I wasn't sure of the answer, but I knew somebody would know. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'll be sending an email to all presenters um, after the conference, just as a reminder to send me your slides. And will you be able to link it? with the recording so that would be that would be perfect yep within the youtube description there'll be a link awesome thank you i think we're going to need an embedded librarian uh little special interest group because we can grow embedded librarianship in suny uh, 
um, over time, I think. I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah. Okay, you guys need to start it. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <yeah. laughs> All right, I'm going to head out. Bye. Thank you. Bye.